So the second lecture on early Christian art, um, we're going to talk about how it develops into Byzantine art. Uh, and this will be a really important thing to understand because we're going to see a lot of influences in the later styles we look at. And Byzantine art will last, um, surprisingly, until the end of the class. Uh, so some of the elements we're going to see here are going to repeat throughout the class. Uh, so what we're looking at is a basilica. It's made out of brick. It's not wood like the ones that were usually made in Roman cities. Um, and this one is in Ravenna in Italy, and it's built in the 6th century. So remember, uh, with the Edict of Milan in 313 CE, it proclaims religious toleration and basically legalized Christianity. Uh, so basilicas were these public meeting places uh, in Roman imperial times, and they became churches in the Christian era which makes a lot of sense. We've already seen how artists, um, and in this case architects, will take um, previous forms and then reuse it. Um, so the, the lesson of this is it's easier to change ideas than it is to change art. Uh, and if you're looking for something to put an extra credit for, maybe you could explore that question. Why is it easier to change ideas than art? So during the 5th century, uh, Germanic tribes overran the Western Roman Empire, uh, and Ravenna was recaptured by the Eastern Emperor Justinian, who we'll talk about in more detail, uh, in 540 AD. Uh, so as I had stated before, the Roman Empire uh, did end, but it was just the Western part. The rest of it continued on, uh, and we're going to see it continue on in some form uh, throughout the class. So this is San Vitale uh, in Ravenna, uh, and it's made in a place that was uh, part of the barbarian invasions, but again, Justinian was able to reoccupy this part of Italy. And on the inside, we see mosaics. So we'd already seen those before with the Christus Sol, um, and we had seen it, um, I didn't show you much in, in imperial times, but it was also very popular medium in imperial times. So what we're seeing here, again, is this idea of taking images that already existed, in, existed and co-opting them uh, and changing them, um, not so much formally, you know, not as much as what you see, more like what they mean. So this is a synthesis of pagan images with Christian ideas. Uh, so Cupid uh, which was, you know, for the ancient Romans, kind of a symbol of earthly things, profane things, uh, love, lust, all those kinds of things, uh, came to represent in Christianity the body. And then Psyche, which is um, the representation for the Romans and for the Greeks as well, as um, the representation, representation of the mind, that came to mean, with Christians, the soul. Uh, so this kind of dichotomy between the body and the soul was really important to Christians. Uh, and they felt like the body had to be preserved um, so that the soul could rejoin it um, after the apocalypse, after the world ends. And those two things could descend together into heaven. Uh, so we're seeing that being displayed here, but it's almost indistinguishable what, with what you would see in ancient Rome. So what we're looking at now is um, the interior of the mausoleum of Gala Placidia, and it's showing a niche with two apostles, um, that's right here, uh, and the St. Lawrence mosaic. Uh, and this is in Ravenna, it's in the fifth century. Uh, so let's take a little closer look at some of these things. The first one, uh, we see some symbols that have been used by ancient Romans, but again, they're repurposed. So the two doves surrounding the fountain symbolize Christian souls drinking the baptismal water of eternal life. Uh, and doves will also represent the idea of the Holy Spirit. And that is something with Christians, and I'll get into more detail with that later on, uh, but it has to do with the idea of God's presence uh, in the world. Um, and you'll notice that the two apostles, and apostles are the closest followers of Christ in, in the Gospels, which are the stories of, of Christ, of Jesus. And you'll notice that they're being portrayed as if they are Roman senators. Uh, so they have short hair, uh, clean shaven. Uh, they're wearing these robes that say, these are important people. 
uh, in the way you communicate to someone who's just coming out of imperial times that someone's important is show them as someone important they can recognize, so a Roman senator. Then when you get down to the St. Lawrence mosaic, um, what we see in a lot of early Christian imagery and continuing throughout the class is this idea of Christian martyrs. Um, so martyrs were important to Christians because remember when we looked at Christianity, um, Jesus, in a way, was a martyr. Uh, Christians believed that he was God made into flesh who sacrificed himself um, for the salvation of humanity. Uh, so um, Christians are really fond of looking at saints as being Christ-like, of acting as Christ would. Uh, so being a martyr is kind of the ultimate Christ-like act that you can do. And there's many feminine martyrs and masculine martyrs, uh, and they are generally tortured and killed. Uh, so like Jesus was tortured and killed, uh, they were as well. Uh, so St. Lawrence, he was martyred over hot, hot coals. And this is a pretty typical way to, to show it. They don't necessarily want to show the violence at this time. Uh, so they show St. Lawrence, uh, and then they have the method of his martyrdom right here, but they don't actually show him being martyred. Um, the other thing that you'll notice, too, is that he doesn't seem to be very concerned about this. Uh, so we don't see expression. Uh, we don't see, like, an interior... Uh, kind of emotion being shown on the face. You know, most people, if they're about to be martyred over hot coals, would be freaking out. Uh, we don't see that on the outside. Um, instead, we see St. Lawrence, like the figures above, being portrayed as this Roman senator wearing the robes, uh, the sandals, and having the haircut of a Roman senator. Uh, so he carries with him, and this is something, again, we're going to see throughout the class, a cross with a long stem that works like a staff. Uh, and that is a piece of iconography, and it means that you're a martyr. Uh, so we'll see Jesus carrying that and figures throughout the class carrying that. The other thing that tells us he's special is this halo. So remember when we looked at Christus' soul, and it was based on images of Apollo. Apollo was the sun god. Uh, so this halo, which, uh, which in Apollo images represented the sun, uh, represents that the person is a spiritual figure. So you can kind of see how these um, same imagery transferred into different meanings again. So a couple of other things you'll notice in this picture is he's holding a book. Uh, so a lot Christians, for Christians, it's very important, the scriptures uh, and, and the gospels are often pointing to um, the scriptures from Judaism and showing how Christ was predicted in those early ones. Uh, so we'll often see martyrs with with you know, what Christians believe to be um, inspired by God, uh, these words and these scriptures. And again, we make this association of Christ with these four books. Uh, so the Gospels have four different writer, writers, Mark, Luke, this is in Latin, Matthew, and John, uh, and those are displayed here. So you can kind of see this as an image of Jesus or an image of Jesus's message. Above this, we see um, this kind of like stylized sky that looks like a nighttime sky. Uh, this is something that the ancient Egyptians actually used to use in their tombs. Uh, and it was um, co-opted and used in this type of imagery. So then if we kind of turn around um, across from uh, the mosaic of St. Lawrence, we see one of Christ. Uh, and in it, Christ wears a purple robe, which is a sign of royalty. Uh, the reason why, just as a side note, that purple was a sign of royalty is because in, in ancient times during the Roman Empire, uh, the material of indigo was the most important commodity in ancient times. Control of that would mean that you would have um, control over other people politically and, and economically. Uh, so indigo in um, ancient times functions similarly that oil does today. It's a commodity that the control over which allows you to have uh, some diplomatic, uh, political, and economic power uh, over others. So as a result, things that are dyed with indigo became a sign of royalty. Uh, obviously, nowadays, we kind of associate indigo with genes, so not a sign of royalty, but you know, times change. Uh, so he's being shown as royalty because he's the king of heaven. 
Uh, but at the same time, uh, he's also being shown as Apollo. He has this long flowing curly hair. Uh, and again, we see the uh, halo, which means spirituality, but remember that it's based on Apollo. And since Christ himself is a martyr, he's holding a martyr staff. Um, there's a bunch of sheep, and I don't know anything about sheep, uh, so you can decide for yourself whether or not these are, are pretty naturalistic sheep, uh, but they do resemble sheep in um, parts of the Eastern Empire. They do have these kind of like longer faces. And then he's sitting on three steps, and the steps represent the Trinity. So I talked about the Holy Spirit before. The Trinity is this concept for Christians that there is one God um, in three parts. Um, so um, there's one God, and then the three parts are God the Father. Uh, and that's the God that is the creator and separate from the universe uh, and you know, kind of formless, all of these things. Um, that conception of God is very similar to what you would see in Judaism and Islam, which we'll talk about later. Um, so then there's the concept of God the Son uh, or God made flesh. Uh, that's when God made himself into a human uh, and then that human was sacrificed. And then the last one is what I talked about before, the Holy Spirit. It's God's presence in the earth. Uh, so the latter two, uh, God made flesh and God's presence in the earth, um, sometimes you see uh, the idea of the Holy Spirit, God's presence in the earth uh, in Judaism, uh, but you don't see either of those conceptions in Islam. And Islam will learn that Jesus is just a um, prophet uh, and not a god. In fact, the conception of God that you have in Islam and in Judaism would make that an impossibility. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So one of the things you'll notice with the pictures we've seen so far is it's pretty similar to the three-dimensional type of paintings that we saw when we looked at um, Roman paintings. Uh, so we can compare them to this picture of Hercules. We have some of the same things going on. We have some foreshortening with the foot of Christ here, uh, just like we did with Amphitryon. Uh, we have, um, you know, kind of like this dynamic thing where we see Christ reaching out and we have the same thing going on here. So it's something that's happening in time. Uh, Jesus literally has his feet on the earth. Uh, he seems to realistically um, sit on these steps. We have some shading, which is harder to do with a mosaic because it's tiny stones, but we still do have attempts at it. Uh, and there's a light source that's coming from over here and we see how the shadows fall. Um, and there's also a little bit of atmosphere perspective. We see some blueing in the background. So we're basically dealing with the same style that we've seen uh, in ancient Roman painting before, but that's gonna change. That's why I'm going over these details. So the blue background represents the dome of heaven. It's covered with stars. Uh, and it's something that came all the way back um, from Egyptian times and the Greeks and the Romans were both fond of it uh, and it survives in this early Christian imagery. It's kind of abstracted obviously, uh, but um, it does survive. And we also things, see things in here um, that are just like kind of cool abstract patterns, but they're still um, emphasizing three-dimensionality. Uh, so when you look at this, you can maybe see these types of exercises where you made the two squares and connected them together to make a three-dimensional cube. Uh, what I think is interesting about this one is that some people read the white parts as the floor and some people read the black parts as the floor. And it's almost like we're seeing a maze from above. Uh, so I think different people see it in different ways, but the idea is to give an illusionistic space. In other words, something that looks like you can actually walk into it. Uh, like it's, it's an illusion. So Adam says, and we're going to see this um, happen in the art, these naturalistic and illusionistic qualities would diminish, giving way to a flattening of space and an increase of spirituality in art. So in the stuff that we had seen previously, they're really emphasizing um, the earthly um, concepts of Christ. You know, he's taking care of the meek on the earth. Uh, he's literally standing on the earth. He sacrifices himself. Uh, and we see that with the way that the Romans and Greeks portrayed their gods. We see them on the earth and interacting with humans. Um, that's going to disappear. Uh, and we're going to see that not only the idea is going to disappear of um, a more earthly Christ, we're also going to see that the art is going to respond to that and try to display that idea of something that's unearthly. That's what we call transcendent. 
Um, in other words, thinking about the afterlife, thinking of um, a spiritual world instead of the earthly world. Um, and you can kind of think about why that happens as we go along in the class, because we're going to do it the rest of the class. Uh, so this is San Vitale again. Um, and German groups, they invade the firmer lands of the Roman Empire. Uh, and Emperor Justinian, uh, who becomes the Eastern Emperor uh, in the 6th century, he takes back Constantinople, recaptures the Mediterranean, um, and this church is in the style of Constantinople. So perhaps uh, by putting this church in a part of the former Western Empire, uh, he's trying to make a political statement, you know, that the new Roman Empire is based in Constantinople, not in Rome. So how it is like uh, what we see in Constantinople is it's centrally planned. So instead of having those rectangular boxes, uh, the basilica form, like we had seen before, we see this central plan. Um, and there's an apse right here. Uh, and there's going to be um, a couple of mosaics we're going to look at. There'll be a mosaic of Jesus right here, Christ. And then um, there'll be one of Justinian here, which we'll look at, and one of Theodora, which we'll look at as well. So this is something that you can do with Christian art. Uh, to kind of understand how hierarchic scale is used in Christian art. So we talked about hierarchic scale, things are bigger, um, they're more important, but other aspects of hierarchic scale are, is it centered? That's more important. For Christians, uh, what they do is they think about how Christ exists in a the picture. They try to look at things from his point of view in the picture. And then they say things that are on his right. Um, so if we're looking at the picture, it would be on our left, but it would be on his right, as if we're looking through Christ's eyes, are more important than things on the left. Uh, so since we have Christ here, and you'd be looking out this way, his right would be the mosaic of Justinian, uh, and his left would be the mosaic of Theodora. Uh, so in this, Justinian is shown as more important than Theodora. But the both of them are up here right across from each other, so we know that the both of them are very important. So this is what it looks like. This is a mosaic of Christ in the middle. Uh, and then, again, we're looking at it through his eyes. Uh, so it would be Christ's right would be over here, and Christ's left would be over here. So we have Justinian over here, uh, and we have Theodora over here. Uh, when you step into the space, you can look up, and we can see some more images of Christ, uh, and one that you might recognize because it's a little bit more modern, um, and some more ways that Christians use hierarchic scale. So when we look up, we see um, a couple of images of Christ. Uh, and it's pretty easy to spot because they're the only ones that are facing in this direction. Uh, so we have up here an image of Christ. And he's shown as someone a little different than what we saw with the Apollo type of Christ. Uh, instead, we see him as if he is a monk in the Eastern Church. Uh, so he has long hair and a beard. So they basically just took the, the spiritual earthly people and then put that on the face of Christ. Uh, and this long-haired, um, long-bearded Christ became really popular, and we tend to see it in recent Christian imagery. As far as how Christ actually looked, um, that would be an interesting thing for you to Google and put on the extra credit board because there's been a lot of studies. Um, I'll give you a hint. Uh, Christ was born in Palestine, so he looked like a Palestinian. Um, and he grew up in the Roman Empire, so he probably didn't have a beard. Uh, and he almost certainly didn't have long hair either. So uh, all the other figures we can see are less important because they're facing a different way. So what figures are facing the same way as Christ? This lamb here. So that tells you that that is someone important, and that's Christ. This angel figure is facing the same way, but, you know, it's... It's not centralized like we see in these two images. Uh, so up here we have Christ, and we have his 12 apostles. Important, but not as important because they're facing a different direction. Uh, and then we have these angels, uh, not as important as the Christ that's in the middle. Um, these types of patterns that we see with these floral patterns that are kind of flat, and they're not trying to portray necessarily real flowers, we're going to see that this is going to have an influence on uh, Byzantine art throughout the class, but also on Islamic art as well. Um, and we'll see other influences from other parts of the world uh, going into this. 
So if you get a little closer, we can see the lamb in the middle. So we saw Christ earlier as the great shep as the um, good shepherd. Uh, so he's taking care of his flock. He's leading the sheep towards salvation. But he's also a lamb himself because he was sacrificed. And we know that it's him because he has a halo over his head. Uh, so this is Christ as the lamb of God. Um, the sacrifice of God for salvation uh, for all Christians. So four angels wear Roman draperies. We're still using that type of imagery uh, and hold the ring of the lamb. So that's what this is with all of the fruit uh, and vines. And we talked about like how that imagery had been used before um, in Christian art. So you get a close up of Jesus and this image of Jesus uh, where he has kind of like a long face, is a little bit older, um, has dark eyes. Uh, this is still pretty common in what's called the Eastern Church or Orthodox Church. So if you go to uh, a Greek Orthodox Church or a Russian Orthodox Church, you'll, you'll often see this type of imagery. But again, it's just, it doesn't represent what Jesus looked like. What it represents is what holy people at the time that this image was made looked like who were on the earth. So both Christ and the Lamb are pictured frontally, while the apostles are depicted on their sides. Uh, and this is a type of hierarchic scale, centralized, centralized, but also facing the same way. It emphasizes Christ's importance. So let's get down to a little closer to the ground, and we can look at the trade as we had seen before, as an Apollo Christ. So a young man with the long flowing hair uh, with the halo behind. Uh, he has a purple robe, although it doesn't look very purple in this picture. Um, but it is purple as well as this one. Uh, again, showing him as the king of heaven. But the thing you'll kind of notice is this is quite different uh, in the way that these figures are portrayed uh, in the concept of three-dimensionality than we had seen previously. Um, so we'll do a, a little bit of a comparison a little bit later on so we can see that better. Um, so this one is on, remember, this is on Christ's right if we're looking through his eyes. Uh, and we see that on the, his right wall. Uh, so we see Justinian, uh, and he's in the middle. And Justinian does an interesting thing. He puts a halo on himself. Uh, generally, later Christian leaders will think that's a big no-no and won't do it. Uh, but at this time, uh, Justinian is pretty confident, and he's able to do it. You notice that Justinian uh, is holding a bowl, and this represents the gift of the church uh, and the gift of you know, just his, everything that Justinian does to Christ. So uh, Christ would be over here in the church. So we see him kind of handing it in that direction. And the other figures are also handing things towards Christ. Uh, so um, Justinian's is on the right of Christ, again, symbolizing his greater importance. Uh, Justinian wears royal purple. Again, it doesn't look super purple here, but it is as Christ does. And Archbishop Maximian, who is conveniently identified right here, holds a jeweled cross. And they're all kind of um, doing a direction towards Christ. So by showing um, Justinian with this halo, he's saying, I'm Christ's representative on earth. Uh, that's not something we'll see in the rest of our class, but Christian leaders don't really do that again until um, in such an extreme way until Louis XIV, which is past the time of our class. Um, so what we'll notice here, again, is that this is a lot less realistic than we've seen before. We don't have a blue sky background or atmospheric perspective. Instead, we just have a gold background. Uh, and when we look at the feet, it doesn't look like they're standing on the ground. It's almost like they're just about to float off the ground. And the figures um, adding to that effect are all very elongated, like, like their, their bodies are floating upwards. Uh, so we see less of an idea of the earthly aspects of Christ and these leaders and more these kind of spiritual, transcendent, rising up to the heavens type of idea. Uh, so Adam says the gold background um, and the flatness is aiming to transport the viewer into a spiritual realm. So we're not looking at this picture as being reality. Uh, we're seeing it as kind of like a supernatural reality. The other thing you'll notice that you might recognize in here is a shield with the Cairo on it. Um, oh, this is a tourist picture, and you can get an idea of what the colors look like um, when you're actually in front of them. Uh, but this Cairo shield uh, relates Justinian to Constantine. Uh, so he kind of sees himself as a successor of Constantine. He sees himself as a Roman emperor, uh, and he sees himself as someone that's fighting 
uh, and getting his power from Christ. Uh, so all these soldiers are shown in that way. So the other thing you'll notice about this style of art is we no longer have individualized faces. And this has the same effect as everything else. It's taking us out of the real world. Uh, so you notice the artist has basically one young man face, uh, one older man face, and then a Justinian face. Uh, and that's the way that um, medieval artists that we're going to see through the rest of the class learned how to make figures. They would just learn one masculine face uh, and you know, a couple of masculine faces, like an old one and a young one, uh, and then maybe some kids, uh, and then a couple of feminine faces, uh, maybe ways to portray angels, and that's it. They're not working off models of the real world or trying to make anything look individualized. Uh, so remember, it's almost more like what we see in ancient Egypt, where we're seeing the figures are representing ideas instead of um, actual people. So on Christ's left, we get Theodora. So Theodora was um, far more powerful than your average empress. Uh, and how she um, kind of gathered this power might not sound so powerful to you, uh, but I'll explain why um, it might have influenced influenced how she was able to uh, insert in, um, exert her influence uh, over her husband. So Theodora was a courtesan before she married Justin. Uh, so you may not be familiar with that term, uh, but a courtesan is basically a woman who uh, trains um, an elite man uh, from childhood usually uh, on how to be a man. Uh, so she would train him on... Um, you know, how to talk about uh, scholarly things, how to talk about religion and philosophy and such. Uh, she would also train him in manners, how to act in certain situations. Uh, you know, like the classic thing you see in the old movies, like tell him what fort to use. Uh, she would train him in that way. Uh, she would try to like kind of build up his conf confidence. And she would also train him in sex. Uh, so all of these things, these duties he was expected to have, uh, she would be responsible for that. And because of that, um, she would be trained in a way that is much different than your average elite woman. If uh, Theodora had been born as an elite woman, I uh, was expected to marry another elite person, like a king or a prince or some other royalty. Uh, she would not have been trained in the same way. Uh, if she was just an elite woman, she would have been trained basically to look good and not say much. But since she has to teach a young man, um, how to be a man. Uh, she was uh, expected to learn the same types of things that men would do. So she would study scholarship and philosophy uh, and mathematics, uh, and she'd be able to speak intelligently about these things. Since she's training a very important person, she would be accustomed to being listened to and for people to take her advice. Uh, so she was very powerful and advised Justinian. Uh, and you can see Justinian, um, who certainly had control over these mosaics, but agreed with that and put her on the wall as well. Uh, so she does wear a purple robe like Justinian, um, and we see her with the halo as well. Uh, the figures, they stand frontally, so we don't have figures turned uh, in different directions to emphasize the three-dimensionality of the space. Instead, everyone's facing forward and smacked up against what we call the picture plane. In other words, that like imaginary barrier between us and the picture. Um, and they're not standing naturally. Again, they look like they're kind of floating. And we see the same thing where we have just a couple of feminine faces and a couple of masculine faces. So there's no differentiation. Since she is on Christ's left, uh, the Christ mosaic would be over here. Uh, and so she's taking the gift that she has for Christ and handing it to him um, in a direction towards our left the viewers left. On her robe, we see some more things that show um, her relationship with Christ. So she gestures as the magi who are embroidered on her robe. Uh, so these are the three kings who supposedly um, in, in the gospels uh, visited Jesus. And Jesus, uh, this is like kind of astounding because Jesus was just like a regular person. His parents weren't important people. Uh, and these kings were like kind of uh, drawn to Jesus uh, by a star that they saw in the sky. Uh, so like the three kings that visit Jesus and recognize his importance, we see uh, Theodora. She is supposed to be like that as well.
when we get in close, we can see that, um, you know, lots of beautiful uh, semi-precious stones in here. These kinds of mosaics are not cheap. Uh, they're very expensive. Uh, and there's a little bit of an attempt at shading, but we don't see like what we had seen in uh, the Roman art or the earlier Christian art that we looked at. Uh, instead, it's more an emphasis on flatness uh, and, you know, kind of these beautiful colors that are being made that show her status and show her importance. So there's a tourist picture so you can get an idea of what it looks like from the ground uh, and perhaps a more delicate looking in this one. So these style of churches and mosaics uh, became very popular throughout the Byzantine era. Uh, and we're going to see how they have some influences on Islamic art as well. Uh, so this is the church of Hagia Sophia. I know the spelling looks weird, but you pronounce it Hagia uh, Sophia. And it's in Istanbul, uh, which used to be Constantinople. And Hagia Sophia literally means holy wisdom. So if you know anyone named Sophia, uh, their name means wisdom, uh, so it's kind of a beautiful name to have. Uh, and it's the Imperial Church of Justinian. Basically, Justinian said to my architects, to his architects, I want you to build something that shows our power, uh, to show that we are equals or even surpass the Roman Empire. And I think they did a pretty good job of it. Uh, so the mosaics with gold that would be similar to what we had seen um, previously are mostly gone now. Um, it was once a mosque, and we'll kind of look at that later on, uh, about um, the spread of Islam and how um, this area in Turkey ended up being Islamic. And we, we can see some uh, Arabic calligraphy in here. But um, now it's a museum. Uh, so lots of visitors down here. But looking at these people, you can get an idea of the scale. It's huge. There's a dome on top of it. So kind of thinking about the Pantheon and what a technical feat that was. Uh, Justinian is trying to match that. Um, so this view, you can see, again, we have the, the um, decoration is different uh, because it became a mosque later on. Um, but I'll show you there are a few things that are left over from the Christian part of it. Uh, and then again, with these views, you can see the tremendous scale of it, uh, which is would have been amazing for people at the time, certainly. Uh, this is the exterior of it. The original church, uh, like we saw with the other uh, centrally planned church uh, in Ravenna, um, is right here. Um, these towers on the outside, they're called minarets, uh, and those were added when it became a mosque later on. So we'll talk about what those mean um, when we get to Islamic art in um, the next lecture. So again, a centrally planned church. Uh, with a big giant dome over it, like we saw in the Pantheon. So very impressive. And some of the old mosaics are left. Uh, this one's from a much later time, from the 13th century. Uh, and you can say on, in the 13th century, we still have these gold backgrounds and such, but we are returning to a little bit more of a naturalistic type thing, like we saw in ancient Rome. Uh, so we have some shading um, on the figures, and the figures themselves more more three-dimensional, but it's still Byzantine because the gold background puts us in an otherworldly type of place. So a good way to understand the changes is to kind of look at these three so you can pause the video and see what's different and what's the same. And that'll really help you out in the test to be able to identify these different styles.